all of you. We're so glad that you're here, that you've taken time for yourselves to come and learn, hopefully, something new. Maybe you're going to be learning some things that are confirmation of what you're already doing. Um, at any rate, we're glad you're all here. Um, so we welcome back Dr. Nancy Emerson Lombardo. She is here to share uh, a lot of information with you. So before we get started, just like in yoga, just like in church, turn off your ringers, please. Thank you for taking a moment to do that. Okay. Um, so um, Dr. Nancy was here, so she's given us permission to call her Dr. Nancy now, now that you know her full name. Okay. Um, uh, she came here last year, and uh, we all wanted more, so she's back again. She is giving us a bonus hour today, all right? So our first hour, we're going to talk about uh, herbs and spices, or as I've been telling you in class, the spicy talk, all right? So we're going to end. Uh, we're going to wrap that one about five minutes, uh, five to two, so that we have time for Q&A. So please save your questions, your burning questions, till the end. And then if you are able to stay for an extra hour, she's going to talk about research that supports uh, exercise to slow cognitive decline. You all, actually most all of you, come here to exercise anyway in all of our beautiful classes. Now you can pull back the curtain of Oz of Nancy's beautiful brain and understand why. She'll talk to you about the research, which is why I am so enthusiastic about you guys coming to class. Okay. <laughs> all right. Um, so that is it. I'm going to turn the mic over. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you, Amy. Yeah. Thanks for inviting me back. I had such a good time. I think it was January. It was it was a beautiful day. And I remember after having a good time speaking with you all and answering questions, because you're on the seacoast, I went and found two neat beaches. One was full of pebbles with the waves coming in and that beautiful music. And then your town beach where everybody had their dogs. <laughs> I had a great time. So I'm really thrilled to, to be here. So let's get going here. I can. Um, I have to coordinate two things here, which is a little hard for my... So our goal is to create healthy, robust, more resilient brain tissue. And there are multiple ways to do it, but well, nutrition is one and exercise is another. It's not in the right place. Okay. All right. So there's lots, lots of ways we can do this and with an active senior center. This is your place to save your brain, right here. And just being together, uh, socializing with each other, turns out to be a really big protective thing for your brain. And learning new material, whether it's how to play new, uh, new music or, or uh, a new game or meeting a new person, that's all good for our brain. Now one reason, and this is kind of a scary slide that some of you might have seen it when I was here the last time, to know that even though your thinking is really clear now and, and you're feeling good about your brain power, Alzheimer's could be working in your brain at this moment. In fact, it could have been going on for 10, 20, even 30 years before there are any uh, noticeable problem. So the pre-symptomatic could go on for, as I said, 20 years. And the very first signs is called preclinical. It's hard to know for sure. This is where we do early intervention. And then you have full-blown clinical dementia, um, which could occur after 30 years of slow buildup of these pathologies in the brain. So what we want to do is to try to prevent it or slow it down if it is going on because we don't know I mean now now we have more ways of testing it that's how we have the new drugs now that we know will remove a beta from the brain was people like yourselves volunteered for studies but anyway meanwhile we've got healthy lifestyles that we can control ourselves to help slow down this process and the neat thing is these healthy lifestyles help us with preventing heart disease, dealing with diabetes, and preventing some of the other neurodegenerative diseases that are out there haunting us. Oh, oh, raise my hand. Good. Oh, thank you. That'll work. <laughs> it's a team effort here. Okay, chronic um, conditions influence the risk for dementia. So this isn't happy news if you already have cardiovascular disease or any kind of um, cardiovascular issue or diabetes or prediabetes, all of these can 
increase your risk for a brain disease like Alzheimer's. So can inflammation and oxidative stress. Now one thing we've learned in the last few years is one of the best things you can do to prevent co cognitive problems is to control your blood pressure. Used to be we thought 140 was a safe number. Now through these studies we know that you want to keep it to 120, 130 in that range. And if you do that, you reduce your risk, MCI is mild cognitive impairment, you can reduce your risk by 20%. That's very dramatic. So that's another, that, that before the recently approved Alzheimer's drugs was really the only thing that we had for prevention. Uh, now we have those new drugs, but they're, you know, invasive. You have to go into a clinic and get an infusion once a month. Okay. Um. <laughs> Vibrated foods, okay. Well, foods alone, uh, based on the evidence today, could delay the onset of Alzheimer's by five years. If you do that, you cut the prevalence in half because the prevalence of Alzheimer's doubles every five years. Also, you can slow the progression of cognitive impairment, as well as stroke and maybe other dementias. And good food, you know, improves overall health for everybody in the family, not just yourself. Um, <laughs> I'll get this eventually. <laughs> okay. Um, clinical trials confirm the power of nutrition for brain health in older adults. Uh, when I first started doing this work, we didn't have the actual proof. We had promising animal studies. We had what are called cohort studies, where hundreds of people would be interviewed about what they ate, and then we'd follow them and see uh, if what they ate related to their risk of getting Alzheimer's and other dementias. So when, when we started getting the clinical trials results, that's when we really knew we were on to something. And among all the different kinds of clinical trials that were going on, um, there were small uh, trials with herbs and spices that were very promising, even for people with early Alzheimer's. And they were done in the first 10 years of this century. I wish I could say, oh, it's 2023, now we've done giant studies and we know we can prove more. No. So I'll be giving you the details about spices. I long thought, and I'll be sharing some of the reasons why, that herbs and spices were being ignored by the other food researchers. And it was easy to see why if they were doing these giant cohort studies asking people what they ate. How do you measure how, many, how much rosemary they're eating or lemon balm or parsley? Uh, all, many of us cook with herbs and spices, but it's small amounts. How do you measure that? And so I think they just didn't try. So therefore, they weren't in the database. Um, so what we have, you'll see, is more animal studies and very small clinical trials with us humans. Meanwhile, the major study in 2014 showed that it really makes a difference if you improve your, your, um, your diet along with exercise and keeping your mind active. And different diets have been researched now and shown to be healthy. Um, one thing I want you to all keep in mind, because you may have family members who have Alzheimer's already, that they have many, even at the time of diagnosis, they have more healthy brain cells than um, famished ones. So all this information is helpful for them as well, not just as a prevention for, for people that are in good shape right now. Um, now I'm just gonna share, because my focus is gonna be on herbs and spices, I wanted to show you at least one other study that um, uh, helped show that what we eat actually slows down the buildup of this. There are two bad pathologies in Alzheimer's, uh, amyloid beta or A beta, and it gets, um, it actually was originally an antimicrobe. It's in everybody, it's in all our cells, but when things go awry, we clump up and then start hurting the brain. Um, so that's one of the targets. The other is called tau, related to helical filaments uh, or tangles. Uh, those are the two pathologies in Alzheimer's. The current drugs remove the A beta from the brain. Um, we haven't come up with a medication for tau yet. 
and it's the one more closely related to actually damaging the brain. Anyway, one thing we learned in the research world, um, ah, okay, sorry. Okay, then, um, so we, we developed new ways of uh, imaging the brain. Uh, PET scans, I learned, are also useful for identifying cancer and other things in the body we wish weren't there. But what, what uh, we now can do is scan somebody's brain while they're alive, thank goodness, and see the buildup of A beta in the brain. And so this imaging study done in Australia, this young lady was able to connect what people were eating by using this formula for the Mediterranean diet. They didn't have to be actually eating the memory. It was foods that are typical. Uh, you get a score for that. She was able to show that people who most closely followed a Mediterranean-like diet um, had the lowest amount of A beta building up in their brain at baseline in over three years, more slowly accumulating. And that um, she also found that the only food that they were able to measure that um, noticeably increased the amount of A beta in the brain, which we don't want, was red meat. And it's still, I mean, we're still not sure of all the reasons why too much red meat, and of course we Americans eat a lot of it, why too much red meat is a problem for the brain. One of my research colleagues um, thinks it's because he does research in mice that red meat causes our gut to make more problem bacteria that then um, somehow affects the amount of A beta in the brain. There is, you've probably heard, the newest research in nutrition is about our gut. And how what we eat affects the health of our gut and there's a direct relationship to many diseases but also to the brain directly. Um, <clears throat> so, Leaky guts from eating too many emulsifiers and ultra-processed food is one way we get into trouble, but apparently eating red meat is one of them. Okay, next. Um, I, I'm going to just give you an over, when I talked the last time, I went into detail about my memory preservation nutrition program. There's many other good uh, brain healthy nutrition programs out there, um, mine is one of them. And it's research based. There are seven strategies that I went over all of them in January. And if you wanted that PDF, if you didn't weren't here last time, it's on, I believe you can download it from my website. And if that's not true now, <laughs> make sure I get it up there. Anyway, um, what I'm going to highlight today are four strategies that herbs and spices help us with. One is that we need to eat an amount and variety of antioxidants. We want to reduce insulin resistance. That means we want to help our blood sugar be healthy because our brain lives on sugar, but it hates it in big amounts. It needs to be slowly fed through a healthy diet. And so we, if you don't do that, you get something called insulin resistance and some vulnerable people that leads to diabetes. But for all of us, it interferes with our brain working well and being healthy. The other thing we want to do is to reduce the amount of LDL cholesterol and avoid trans fats. Well, that's just not eating them. The spices won't take them out of our body. And we want to reduce sugar intake. And I'll be showing you how herbs and spices help us with those three. Another thing it does very, very well is reduce inflammation. All these herbs, and I brought uh, some samples of herbs from my garden that you're free to, we're gonna pass out some of them because they smell good, and you're free to, when you leave, take, take some other samples. But um, all of them help reduce inflammation. So um, I'm gonna share a, some, some other, some additional particulars of how the overall strategy and then hone in on, uh, okay, next slide please. <coughs> uh, so we want to increase the amount of variety of antioxidants. Why? Oxidative stress pay, plays a major role in brain cell deterioration. Oxidative stress means, you know, by the nature of breathing, we, we end up with too much, much uh, oxygen. It's really hard to imagine this, 
but it's like parts of us rust inside. We, and that's not good for us. It destroys our DNA. So you want to eat foods that are antioxidants to prevent that from happening because oxidative stress speeds up brain cell deterioration, AD pathology, and other um, problems. Every antioxidant-rich food tested in Alzheimer mice led to better thinking and reduced beta amyloid. So what's interesting is each individual food in the mice helped. And for us, of course, we don't eat one food at a time. We eat a whole diet. And so uh, we want a variety of these really good foods. They also improve your blood sugar, improve your lipid profile, and decrease inflammation. Um, and the best source of antioxidants is plants. Um, leafy greens and spices and herbs are the top of the um, food chain there that help us the most. And some of you who have eye issues know that you, you eat some really special um, maybe supplements that contain uh, wonderful, um, mostly the source is plants, like lutein. Um, those same antioxidants help your whole brain. Next slide. Um, excess sugar is toxic to the brain. I won't dwell on this, but one of our strategies is to use sweet tasting spices and other flavors to replace sugar because um, sugar is addictive, which you probably heard about, and it's just so awful for our brains. You might not have known this. It's so pro-inflammatory. It inflames your whole body. That's why if you have arthritis and you eat a bunch of sugar, within an hour or two, you're going to hurt. And um, a lot of people don't realize it because it's not instantaneously. It's a little bit later. And um, that inflammatory process from eating too much sugar and white carbs actually speeds up cognitive decline and the buildup of Alzheimer pathology. And it actually shrinks our hippocampus, that's the seat of our memory in our brain, there's two of them. And even in teenagers we can see this. Some researchers have been studying that. And then there are studies with the mice and they showed that they, they fed them exactly the same diet except one had plain water, one had water laced with sugar. And the mice um, developed memory deficits and increased LDL cholesterol, as well as increased A-beta. And a similar study was later done with humans and uh, by Suzanne Kraft and showed some of the same issues. And I just leave you with this. I admire this fellow. He's not quite as young as he looks in that picture, but he's younger than me. He has lots of Alzheimer's in his family, and he runs the uh, a prevention center now in Florida. It used to be in uh, New York City. And his quote that I like is, if you want to take a fast train to Alzheimer's disease, just eat lots of sugar. So if that's the only message you leave with today, um, that's it. And if people are, some people are playing around with a ketone diet and uh, using lots of coconut oil to get ketosis. It's another way your brain works without sugar. But he recommends fasting as a safer way to do that. And uh, I don't know if any of you have tried fasting, but sometimes that helps you feel better. I'm not an expert in it, but that's what he recommends. Now, um, reducing insulin resistance is related, uh, of course, to this problem of sugar. So what you want to do is eat less, reduce, uh, eat less of refined carbs, sugars, and processed foods, especially ultra-processed foods. I've learned there's a difference, because food processing has been going on for millennia. Like we make jam, or we make a pie, or bread. That's processed. But the problem is, in modern times, is ultra-processed, where all these fake materials are used, which actually destroy like your, your gut um, integrity and get lead to, uh, to a leaky gut. I mean, there's all sorts of things that you need to try to eat less of these ultra-processed foods that aren't really foods, um, are not nutrients. Um, we also um, suggest you avoid nitrates. A lot of processed meats have nitrates added to for preservatives, and unfortunately that interferes with your insulin health. And what you need is to eat more foods that regulate blood sugar. 
And among, uh, besides things like beans and lentils, nuts and seeds, and fish, and green vegetables, and whole grains, and green tea, uh, cinnamon and other spices help you do that. Cinnamon, um, it's been recommended one teaspoon a day. It might seem like a lot, but cinnamon's easy to consume in your coffee and uh, maybe on toast or other ways. Uh, it really helps you. And then cloves and nutmeg and other foods uh, help you do that as well. And what's interesting to know for those of us who might have a little sweet tooth is that there's one confection that is actually good for you and that's uh, dark chocolate. It has to be 70% cocoa. But cocoa, and I'll tell you a little more about it, is like a spice, it's so powerful. But you can't counter that with too much sugar, too much fat, or it, it doesn't work. Like milk chocolate doesn't help us. Um, and foods that help lower LDL cholesterol, again, there's a whole long list of them, but among them are spices and herbs. And some of the stars for that were cinnamon and turmeric. That cinnamon comes up again. Because a lot of foods that help us with our blood sugar also help us uh, keep our LDL cholesterol under control. Um, and for cooling inflammation, again, spices and herbs. Um, what we have seen is that for the overall brain healthy diet, there are certain foods that help us with multiple strategies and spices and herbs are one of them. Among the most anti-inflammatory of the herbs and spices are turmeric, ginger, rosemary, which many of you probably grow in your garden, uh, very strong flavored, oregano, I did bring some oregano with me, holy basil is another kind of basil, but regular basil helps a lot too, and cinnamon, and your cinnamon again, and hot peppers. The hotter they are, the more they cool us. I kind of like that because my dad and my twin brother really love peppers. Now, um, I won't go into detail about this, but I mentioned in passing that beta amyloid, why it seems to be omnipresent, is part of our ancient immune system. People at MGH were the first to come up with showing um, how, how pervasive a beta is in our body and that its original role was to help protect the brain from microbial invaders. So um, the amount of beta amyloid increases when foreign microbes are present and surround the individual bacteria, viruses, and perhaps other microbes in order to neutralize their effect. But if this gets out of con control, it can lead to neuroinflammation, um, and that could cause harm to the brain. So one of the questions we had was, could antioxidant, anti-inflammatory power of herbs and spices perhaps uh, plus their own antimicrobe aspect help counter this problem with excessive beta amyloid. We don't have the answer to that yet, but it's a good question. Okay, so as I mentioned at the beginning, the herbs and spice research has been increasing, but not, not as far, fast as we, we would like. Um, you're, you're keeping up with me without me raise, I forget to raise my hand, but you're doing good. <laughs> um, more, there's more and more lab studies, including animal studies. Lab studies could be they're looking at cell cultures of brain tissue. That could be a lab study. And then the rest are animal studies. Um, and they help us see potential me mechanism for slowing problem pathologies of this A-beta protein, or, or P-tau means phosphorylated tau. That's the abnormal tau that leads to tangles. And then some herbs and spices uh, people looked at to see if they could enhance the memory neurotransmitter that is in decreased amount in Alzheimer's disease. A lot of it's called, um, uh, a lot of the uh, first drugs for Alzheimer's have been around, I guess, 20 plus years, helped with that, uh, like Aricet, um, Remeril, and Exelon, um, and, and cholinesterase inhibitors were what that, those are. So um, some people were saying, well, what if a nerve could do that? Because a lot of these drugs have side effects. Like some people do very well and it helps them retain their memory for a bit longer, uh, but others get so many side effects gastrointestinal that they can't take them. 
So these are all very uh, interesting, but even at this time, there are no new large trials with like a, a couple thousand people. And I, I hadn't realized until I looked at the literature over the last 10 years, especially, that a trial that was going on um, in early, well, 23 years ago, in the early 2000s, I was then still pretty active with the National Alzheimer's Association. And uh, Steve Dukowski was, I think, chair of our Med Sci Board for a while. He led, he got big funding to do a giant trial of ginkgo biloba. Um, RDDPC means a randomized double blind placebo controlled trial. And to get funding to to research 3,000 people for two years. Oh my goodness. That was very unusual. And the sad thing was, and I'll show you the results, was it was a bust. And I didn't realize that that might have depressed um, anybody else trying to get funding for to look at a different herb or spice. It, um, that's probably why the federal government hasn't been funding uh, other big trials because at the time, if you think about 20, those of you who are as old as I am, if you think about 20, 30 years ago, PICO, it's still looked at as something that can enhance, uh, say, awareness and sharpness. So it was really being looked at as something that could help people maybe um, prevent dementia, not just help you in the moment. Um, but it was a bust. At the, the way they designed the trial. And I think it set back research on herbs for, well, at least 20 years. So, so all the other ones that I, I'm going to share some about individual spices, the, when they got to the point of doing human um, randomized clinical trials, they're all very small, like 40 people, 50 people, 20 people. Now, the one, some of them were promising. But you can't rely usually on that small a number unless the results were like overpowering. Now the, the other thing you notice is for the most part, herbs and spices, what, it's kind of tricky because um, how do you pick uh, what exactly to study? Are you going to use the whole fresh herb? Are you going to use dried herbs or spices? Or are you going to try to do an extract of some kind? what exactly you're going to study, and then what if some extracts of, say, rosemary are healthy, but others aren't? So safety is number one. Most herbs and spices are safe. Humans have been using them for centuries. But when you start concentrating them, could you run into trouble? So we'll learn more about that. And then they used um, model, 18 models of mice means we've learned how to take the genes that cause health, that to genetically modify the brains of mice so they look like Alzheimer's. Now most Alzheimer's is not genetically based. Age is much more a risk factor. But there are a couple of very rare strains of, of um, genes that if you inherit it, you will, uh, you will get Alzheimer's disease. But they're very rare, you usually get it in your 40s or 50s. Those are the kind of genes that they put into the brains of mice that have to mimic Alzheimer's disease. And uh, so then they use them to test different foods, such as herbs and spices, to see what can we learn. Do they help with the antioxidant process like we think? Would it have anti-inflammatory effects? Would it help uh, brain power? And uh, so among the different studies uh, that were done in the early days, the mice studies, they showed multiple brain benefits of clove, cinnamon, and nutmeg. All these spices that seem strong, they actually are. And they can strongly help us because they're powerful antioxidants, anti-inflammatory, and compounds, you're keeping up with me and you're like, it's like we're working together and I'm not even doing my part of it. <laughs> so, and they also can help your mood, uh, calm anxiety, help with sleep, help with memory, ease pain. Now these are all mice studies, but they give you a lot of ideas 
goodness, I just thought they were pumpkin pie spices. <laughs> they could do all these things, wow. And then um, other studies were done in bigger, like apes are more like us. So um, cucurbin has been of interest to people because it's such a powerful anti-inflammatory agent. Now, anybody who's cooked with turmeric knows that uh, most recipes have you have some fat in the recipe. Because it turns out to get to be bioavailable in the human body, it, it has to be dissolved in fat. So when they were doing the clinical trials in apes, they had to dissolve, they took cucurbin is, the, is what they think is the active ingredient inside turmeric, it's very yellow. And they had to dissolve it in fat. And they found that in apes it improved some types of memory, but not others. It improved spatial, but not recognition. But recognition would be including recognizing an object or a person. Spatial um, is a different kind of uh, memory. And then for several herbs, animal and cell studies have looked for and often found uh, that, that this herb or spice could inhibit the buildup of A beta in the brains of the animal. Um, or could prevent what happens as A beta gets more in volume, it starts clumping. It's called the ligamerization, and that is when it starts destroying brain cells. So either slowing down the buildup or preventing the clumping could help um, with uh, prevention of Alzheimer's uh, or treatment. And then others they looked at whether it would prevent tau from becoming abnormal through this process called hyperphosphorylation. I don't expect you to remember it in this term. But the point is that could uh, individual spices and herbs help prevent either of these problem pathologies in the brain? If it happens in animals, then maybe it would happen in humans. So what we've learned overall is that all herbs, and some of this is repeating what I said before in a different way, they're all very potent antioxidants in small volumes. They're mildly to strongly anti-inflammatory. They have a positive impact on blood sugar and cholesterol. This is all of them. And then some of them are really potent anti-inflammatory agents. Hot peppers, turmeric, ginger, oregano, rosemary, aloe vera, and many others are stars in that category. And those with high ORAC values are likely help prevent excess of this A beta or beta amyloid buildup. And uh, it have especially great impact on blood sugar and cholesterol, such as turmeric, cinnamon, and nutmeg. Now, what is ORAC? ORAC is a way that, through our US Department of Agriculture, we measure the antioxidant value of different foods. So in a minute, I'll show you a chart of how some of the different herbs and spices compare. Now, in addition to those um, positive things, many herbs and spices also help boost our immune system. They improve our blood flow and lower blood pressure. I'd like to know more about that. And then um, the, the key for just general um, food strategies is they help flavor our foods without salt, fat, or sugar. I innovated that work with uh, senior living residences. I think we started in 2007. I just heard from the lead chef, uh, Kim, and she's still working for them. They still have their brain healthy cooking. And one of the first things we did just signify things were a little different. Instead of just having salt and pepper on the table, we added mixed spices and a bottle of cinnamon. And uh, then some of these herbs also kill or fight microbes. Uh, ginger, you may know, um, helps kill viruses, but so does Melissa, the lemon bomb, which I'll be talking more about. Uh, cinnamon kills bacteria. Remember, why did people go to such a difficulty to get um, spices? You know, all the uh, exploration that led Columbus and Vasco da Gama to go around uh, leaving the safety of Europe they were trying to get to the spices because we didn't have refrigeration and spices help preserve food. It wasn't just that they tasted great. Now here's a chart, um, you'll have it. I'm not gonna go into the details other than you can see at the top, cloves 
and they are really they are really kind of intense. This in close is the highest uh, amount uh, per 100 grams, and and then you can pick out something else like oregano, dried oregano, and dried rosemary, and those are very strong tasting, uh, popular herbs in the Italian culture. Very strong. Times right behind them. Ground cinnamon and turmeric are are right up there, and sage, parsley, even parsley, though it jumps down a notch. And nutmeg, who I think of as strong as cloves and cinnamon, actually is about half half as strong. Basil is pretty strong. Coke, and there's cocoa. So, and then over on the next column, you see things like nuts, and then raw, raw and fresh spices. That doesn't mean people often ask, well, is it important to cook with fresh spices or dried? They're both good. It's what use what you have. Uh, fresh, uh, you know, adds a different um, kind of texture and flavor to, uh, say, a salad. But if you don't have fresh, using the dried on whatever you're cooking is better than using none. And you can find all sorts of interesting mixtures. Like if you go into an Armenian store, they will have really inexpensive, really big bags of mixtures of, of different kind of green herbs that are tasty and you can put on anything. So um, I think that chart is interesting to have. And while green tea is really important, it's, it's way lower in its antioxidant power than um, the herbs. So uh, I'll just leave you with this thought about hot peppers. Some people can't tolerate them. If you have GERD, they aggravate it. But the hotter the pepper, the more it helps cool the inflammation within you, which I think is just kind of cool. <laughs> so, uh, but even, even mild peppers uh, have so many antioxidants that are really good for us. Um, so the other thing that um, some other research done, it was a cohort study, showed that hot peppers may also extend life and reduce all-cause mortality by 25%. That's pretty cool. So again, some people can't tolerate the heat, but even slight, slight heat can be helpful. Um, and this I found interesting. Um, i got to watch the time here. Uh, aloe, we think of uh, something that we put on our skin for a sunburn. Why does it work? Well, it's anti-inflammatory. Some of you know you can actually ingest aloe. It's often recommended to treat um, like ulcers and other st uh, stomach issues. Well, um, what one group of enterprising researchers figured out is that it also crosses the blood-brain barrier. And so they wanted to see that if its anti-inflammatory powers could help the brain. Um, it was a very small study. It was in the US at the University of Miami. And it did seem to help. But it was, again, a very small trial, uh, 34 people with mild to moderate Alzheimer's. And it was really an open label study. And they used a proprietary formula, um, whereas you can buy aloe almost in any um, natural food store, uh, like a liquid. But they used this proprietary because I thought that they would be getting more studies done in trying to market their the special product, but they, they have it. And I don't know the reasons for that. And someone else um, did a similar study, but with only 15 people with um, multiple sclerosis you know, for one year. And they also found, they both found what they thought were positive improvement um, in thinking for uh, people with mild to moderate Alzheimer's, but it wasn't a double-blind study and no, nothing follow-up. And the uh, MS uh, was was positive, but for 15 people, that's too small a study. They did say show that there were few minor uh, adverse effects, which is good. You want something with no, you know, few to no side effects. Some of these I'm going to just skip through because you'll have them. Most of you probably don't know what ashwagandha is. But it's been uh, popular in Ayurvedic medicine for over 3,000 years. So a lot of these things that have a long history, people have started looking at. They didn't have any adverse effects, but the um, 
the randomized clinical trial they did, and it was randomized double blind, had uh, 50 adults, and they show you they used 300 milligrams to twice a day. Um, those with the treatment performed significantly better on the tests that they used um, and after only eight weeks. So you would like to see no, no effect on memory or visual space, but that's, you know, some positive results. How come? More studies, please. So uh, it, to me, it's reassuring that at least some are going on. Cinnamon, um, as I mentioned, uh, there have been a lot of studies related to control of blood sugar. So I think it's a pretty safe uh, spice to use. And it seems like it could be helpful for the brain, but there haven't been um, major clinical trials on that. Uh, <clears throat> ginger is another of my favorite spices. And if you know, it really helps with nausea and with uh, your digestion, and it's really this powerful anti-inflammatory agent, an antioxidant, and seems to suppress the expression of beta amyloid based on my studies, but um, no, no real uh, randomized clinical trials for Alzheimer's yet. So um, they did uh, a small trial in um, middle-aged women uh, without side effects. It seemed to enhance cognitive processing and attention. Again, that's kind of weak results. Why? I'd like to see more. Same with turmeric. And here, um, different people have used different ac extracts, and <clears throat> this slide shows some of the details, which is, you know, <laughs> but probably not of interest to you. Um, the one trial that uh, used a particular kind of um, extract, Therma curmin. Uh, see, it, the trouble with turmeric is it's not very bioavailable. Uh, it's hard to get it to actually um, get into the body, into the brain to actually do anything. That's its main challenge, uh, even though it's so, such a powerful um, herb for so many different reasons that I list here. And it, it did seem to uh, show significant cognitive improvements in these 40 people over 18 months. That's a long study, 40 people. Um, did seem to show a significant cognitive improvements in memory and attention, and it seemed to decrease A beta and this other P, P tau. Um, but, um, these were people, uh, regular adults, uh, not non-demented. Gary uh, Small is a very excellent researcher, but again, no, no follow-up. So there seemed to be something good going here. Um, there's been extra interest in turmeric because it's so, had powerful results in animals, but it's just really hard to work with in us humans. So what I recommend is you use lots in your cooking. Sprinkle this yellow powder on every, it's actually great on chicken wings, for instance, or any kind of chicken cooked almost any way. So, or you can put it in soups and stews. Maybe not on a salad, but there's lots of ways you can use it. Just make sure there's some fat involved in your recipe. Uh, ginseng uh, is another uh, popular traditional herb. Um, small clinical trials done. Uh, promising findings in animals, but nothing of huge uh, interest in the human uh, trials. Um, modest, modest positive results at 12 weeks that disappeared uh, 12 weeks later. So again, it's maybe promising, but not enough evidence. Same with go to cola. Uh, Ginkgo by Lobe, I mentioned this is the huge trial that was a bust, and I looked for the reports, and they didn't mention adverse effects, so there probably weren't any, that's side effects. And I didn't understand why they only reported using um, this one um, outcome measure. What about, what if the endpoints had been different? In those days, we didn't have the biological markers like PET scans and finding A beta in the blood and the spinal fluid Maybe if it was done today, 
they might have gotten more positive readout, but because they were looking for it to reduce the number of people with MCI uh, and normal cognition, their, their endpoint was to prevent the incidence of dementia. Uh, they weren't looking so much for, uh, you know, more, um, uh, let's say exact or or uh, detailed measures like in change in cognition or these biomarkers they didn't have, and I ju you just wonder if they did it today, would it have been considered a bust? But we'll never know because nobody's going to touch that again for a while, and that's sad. Now the family that I got really excited about because this is what's growing in our yards is, and I didn't know they were all related. Now maybe some of you did. They're all in what's called, broadly speaking, the mint or salvia family. And I'm not sure I can pronounce this. Can any of you lament sigh? And um, so look at the list. Basil, they're all aromatic. Um, they're, and they're all cousins. So basil, mint, and mint could be peppermint, spearmint, uh, sage, or there's lots of different kinds of sages. And then, yeah, this is the lemon balm. <laughs> There's lots of little pieces of that. It's called it Melissa. Serious. And it smells so good. And it grows um, wild in my yard. I planted one plant, now it's all over the place. And then I got into brain healthy nutrition work. And I said, oh, it's trying to give me a message. <laughs> it's, it's been studied for, for, I mean, it's got a reputation for centuries of being helpful for the brain and for all sorts of things. And lavenders in the same family, savory, scrutillaria, marjoram, oregano, thyme, hyssop, and perilla is that green leaf that you see in sushi sometimes, all in the same family. And this other one that I, I know it's in the same family, but I don't know what it is. And I'm, maybe we'll pass some of this around too. But it's my Korean neighbors brought me a sample plant. They said it's called, um, they call it sesame leaf. And it grows big. And then they use the leaf to wrap, uh, let's say they made a little um, uh, thing with uh, rice and, uh, and meat and, and other spices and put it together. And instead of wrapping it in bread, they wrap it in this leaf, which is really delicious. It's very... It's kind of strong tasting, but I find it, I, I now grow tons of it. So if any of you are interested in this, yeah. anybody finds the botanical name, I, I really should do a search for it, but it's very obvious when you look at it, it's in the same family. And so I use it in all my salads. I will put not only bits of basil and parsley, any, any of these spices, uh, and maybe you didn't think of that. When you make a green salad, put any of these herbs that you've got lots of in your garden. You hardly taste it. It doesn't take over the salad, but it makes it so much richer and healthier. You had a... Yes, what did you call that Korean? Uh, my friends called it sesame leaf, like the seed sesame, but it's not related to the seed. And so, anyway, I invite you to try, try it out. So, um, and then when you start looking into this, you see that these are all considered medicinal uh, herbs in some, in multiple cultures. This slide gives you an example of some of the reasons that um, people have regarded these herbs as um, healthy. So I have several pictures. So, now it turns out some of them have had Reputation to be helpful to the brain. So sage is one of them. And one thing you have to realize is there are a few herbs you don't want to eat tons of. One of them is this certain kind of Spanish sage. You don't want to eat a huge amount. It could be toxic. That's very unusual, and it's mainly the ones that that's telling me I need to move along quickly. Um, <laughs> that uh, it's really the ones from Turkey that have a high camphor content that are the problem. The rest, uh, all other kinds of sage, the kind of sage that you probably grow in your garden, those are totally harmless. You don't have to worry. Um, 
Clinical trial evidence to date suggests that SAGE could improve cognitive function and alertness. Um, and then there were several studies. One was done, this one guy named, I can't pronounce his name, Akon Zada, he, he did a, a series of small clinical trials, usually 40, 42 people, people with already have diagnosed of mild or moderate Alzheimer's. He would run the trial double blind for four months and he was able to show positive results for all of these herbs. So this one was done with salvia officinalis and um, it, it describes what he used, the 60 drops a day of a certain abstract and statistically significant better cognitive results using a really good um, outcome measure called the ads cog and the cdr sum of boxes that was used by all the big clinical trials in the u.s at the time now these took place in iran and i think maybe that's and he published in really really well respected and re well reviewed um, nutritional journals so people uh, believe these results but Again, nobody picked it up and then did it with, say, uh, 100 people, 200 people, 1,000 people. So it, it's, up, it's up to future researchers to see if somebody will pursue. And you'll see there's multiple studies done, and they're all in the same family. So it makes me really uh, feel that uh, there's something here, and one of these herbs is going to turn out to be really stunning. Now here are some of the common compounds and cell. There's so many different um, helpful, uh, that's a beautiful thing about plants. It's not one element, there's like a hundred or a thousand. And uh, the uh, things in herbs and spices that give them flavor are, are the very things that help our bodies in such a dramatic way. Uh, here's uh, another diagram of showing all the different possible effects based on their pharmacology and these were done uh, with, with um, cell cultures and animal studies. Antidepressant, antioxidant effects, animal and beta, cholinergic is uh, helping the memory neurotransmitter, neurotrophic meaning helping our brain cells grow, and anti-inflammatory, but also the antidepressant and anti-anxiety effects. And then there's holy basil, so others have done studies with those. Again, uh, usually positive results, but nobody repeated them. And then there's one done in rosemary. Um, what's interesting about rosemary, however, that the best results were with the lowest dose. It turns out some spices, if you, if you have too high a doses, it, it actually gives you negative effects. So again, these are, if something, somebody once told me, if something is powerful enough to give you an effect that you want, like cognitive improvement, it's powerful enough to give you a side effect. So what you're looking for is what is that magic spot where you get the positive effect, but you don't get the negative. So some spices, you could eat as much as you want, but it looks like rosemary, um, you have to watch um, how much. Now, Melissa, this is what we just passed around. That's the other name, Afish, Melissa Officinale. Uh, the same fellow in Iran did a study with this, and he found, um, again, positive results with a small number of people. And then other people have done clinical trials that, again, uh, some, some were, uh, found no significant effects but others, like the guy in Iran, found positive effects. Um, spearmint. Now, this is the one I'm going to be watching. I had not even thought about spearmint being something for the brain. But what's interesting is this company that did this study, they um, are in the food business. And they refine, they grow lots of spearmint, and then they refine it for, like, I suppose, saying I'm out of time okay um, they're doing it for the food industry lots of things have mint flavor right and what if the same product when they study it for the brain is helpful 
Well, then we got a ready source. And it's already tested to be safe. So let's watch what happens with this. Again, they, they had a slightly bigger trial. It's 90 subjects uh, with a 900 milligram dose of working memory and spatial working memory accuracy improved by 15% and 9% respectively. And improvement in ability to fall asleep. Hey, there, this, this is what I'm going to watch. And, um, and then I, the last spice I'm going to mention is saffron. This is the one that I think might have, besides spearmint, this is the other one I want to watch. The same guy from Iran showed, he did a head-to-head -head, head trial. But the other ones, when he did lemon balm and sage, they were against a placebo. That was what he compared the herb to. This one was saffron. He did it with Aricet. And what he found was that um, the, the saffron did just as good as the Aricet in helping maintain the memory of the people with early Alzheimer's and with no side effects. This is another one to pay attention to because so many people cannot uh, use, as I said, these um, drugs that would help. They're not slowing, um, the drugs aren't slowing progression, but they really help people sometimes for several years maintain their memory because it's helping keep more of the memory neurotransmitter active in the brain. And what I would think is saffron is such a sp powerful spice for other reasons that it might also help um, in, a, in, in its own way slow down progression. So those are the two spices I want you to pay attention to, or at least I'm going to, is saffron and spearmint, and hope maybe some of the others will um, work out. This one is a, a nice diagram, you have it. And I, um, the last one I wanted to mention was the dark chocolate, because I mentioned cocoa's like a spice. And so I want to just skip now, just so you know that you've got all this information, here's some ideas of how to put more herbs and spices in your life. And then um, uh, there's some gu other guides for you about your overall program, but I want to go to Q&A at this point. So the, weird, the weird start slide.